My talk is possibly not humorously titled uh, Apache Spark and R, a big data love story. There's a good reason for this, sort of, um, in that when Spark 1.4 came out, um, sp uh, support for R was folded into the main project, um, which at the time seemed like a very good idea. Um, in retrospect, whilst that was a good idea, the features that were available um, at that time uh, are a bit of a story in themselves which we'll get to later. So, um, a little bit about me first of all. I'm, as Chris says, I'm Mango's technical architect. Um, if any of you saw uh, Rich Pugh's talk earlier about defining a data scientist, that's my profile. It, um, as you can see, skews quite heavily towards the kind of technology um, things rather than um, modeling and visualization and so on. Um, I design and deploy analytical computing environments for Mango's customers as well as for internal projects as required. And I'm not really an R user or a statistician. So if anybody's got any tricky questions about modeling or anything like that, I'm probably not the person to ask. So everybody's talking about Spark lately. I mean, a lot of that, as I say, is because um, the Spark R project was folded into the main project with the release of Spark 1.4. Um, just to briefly go over what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about the rise of big data in general rather than Spark specifically, um, and then some barriers that people have to implementing their big data projects, um, which we see quite a lot, unfortunately. Um, we've got a little section on big data versus R because they're sort of solving different problems. Um, and then we'll be talking about Spark itself, Spark and Hadoop, um, Spark R, the uh, R package, and then we'll, I'll be trying to decide whether or not it actually is a, a love story. So on the rise of big data, um, storage prices have plummeted over the past well, they've been plummeting probably since storage began, but um, particularly over the last, say, five to ten years, um, storage prices have dropped significantly. Um, and that's been coupled with a kind of commoditization of uh, compute infrastructure. So for a lot of organizations now, especially larger organizations, um, you've got low storage prices coupled with commodity hardware um, which all sort of feeds into your compute infrastructure strategy. Um, in line with this, the volumes of data that people have been interested in capturing and recording and analyzing um, has risen dramatically. So um, we still probably all have the same disk space challenges today that we had back when uh, 1.4 megabyte floppy disks were a thing. Um, so the Hadoop project ties these two things together into uh, arguably a cohesive um, kind of computing and analytics environment. So it covers your storage, it covers your analytics with uh, Hadoop MapReduce and some of the other projects that are built on top of there. Um, we see a lot of barriers um, to adoption with all big data, but Hadoop in particular. Uh, I'd probably be using Hadoop and big data, big data uh, interchangeably in this talk because the two things are um, not completely synonymous but at least broadly synonymous. Um, so the Hadoop ecosystem is extremely complex. Uh, in the early days of Hadoop you had HDFS which is the um, Hadoop distributed file system um, which is your storage layer and then on top of that you had Hadoop MapReduce um, which is the MapReduce programming paradigm um, and that's largely written in Java, which is not something that we find a lot of analysts are that hot on or that interested in. Um, and then MapReduce itself, because it's quite slow and because of the kind of barrier to entry that is Java for a lot of people uh, with kind of stats and maths backgrounds, um, it's not that well suited to exploratory interactive analysis. MapReduce is also generally quite slow. Organizations, a lot of organizations have moved away from it um, in recent times. Um, the original paper on, I mean, MapReduce is an old concept, but 
um, the paper that kind of kick-started the Hadoop um, revolution from Google um, is quite old now and a lot of people have moved away from using MapReduce purely because of the, um, the time it takes to get things built. And then from the, on the R side, um, we've got R Hadoop, which is a great, well, was a package, is now a set of packages, so it's actually R HDFS and RMR2, which is the MapReduce component, um, is built on top of MapReduce. Works really well, um, can be a bit tricky to set up and get going with, but once it's working, it works very well, but it's still on top, it's another layer on top of MapReduce, which, as I say, has kind of fallen a little bit out of favour uh, in recent times. So, some of the problems um, with big data deployments. The, um, a lot of Hadoop deployments, and we hear this a lot from our customers, um, don't achieve an appreciable return on the investment. And a lot of that is down to staffing and getting people with the right skills access to the environment in a way which they feel that they can work with it. So, in a lot of big organizations, the, uh, all of the IT functions, and that would include um, a lot of the statistics stuff that goes on in larger companies, um, are heavily siloed. So you'll have one team that deals with storage and one team that deals with networks and another that deals with virtual machines and uh, stuff like that. So it's difficult for those organizations to put a team in place that has the necessary uh, both technical skills to support and manage the infrastructure and look after um, everything that's going on in there and do the analytics on top of that. Um, so it's, it's been a difficult thing for uh, a lot of businesses to achieve. And this is particularly true, as I say, in those large businesses. Uh, and a lot of it is due to inertia for just getting the right people access to the to the environment and finding those people uh, either within the business or recruiting them from uh, external. Um, so, as I say, a lot of this is down to processes rather than any kind of inherent problems with the technology or anything like that. So, the barriers are often down to the siloing that we see in uh, sort of large IT uh, organisations. So then we get this question come up a lot. Hadoop or big data, however you want to term that, um, versus R. R is in many senses the opposite. So on the Hadoop side, until, and it's, I've put recently, but it's not that recent, I suppose. Um, there are a lot of other things built on top of the Hadoop stack now that do provide uh, a kind of entry point for more interactive type analysis. So you've got a lot of SQL implementations on top of Hadoop, which are much faster for certain types of analysis than MapReduce was, although a lot of people are still using MapReduce. Um, Hadoop obviously supports massive data sets. That's its background. That's where it comes from. Um, and that, that support for, for massive data sets is really the kind of core philosophy behind the Hadoop stack. Um, and it's easy to scale these things because, as I said earlier on, the storage and compute um, infrastructure is generally considered in large organizations to be commodity infrastructure now. And you can scale uh, horizontally by adding, simply adding more nodes to your cluster all the time. Um, so then we get back to this problem of MapReduce can be slow and deploying the right talent around the environment can be a, a really big challenge for, for a lot of these organizations. So we can contrast that with the situation in the R world um, where R is obviously uh, an interactive thing lar largely. I mean, you know, you can run batch operations in it, but it's got a kind of a history of, and a kind of reputation, I guess, for, um, for interactive work, particularly with things like RStudio and so on. So you can run interactive analyses really, really easily. Um, it's generally very fast um, for the most part. We'll get to a slight limitation with that in a moment. Um, and it's great for exploratory work or batch work, depending on how it's deployed. Um, so it is single-threaded. There are ways that you can paralyze your code, I'm sure you'll all know. Um, 
but that gets harder the further away from the core machine that you go. So you can parallelize across cores, that's one additional level of complexity, but then if you try and take that across multiple machines and parallelize across multiple machines, that becomes uh, significantly more complicated. Um, and then you're limited by the available memory for that machine. So if you've got a machine with 32 gigabytes of RAM, you can you know, pretty quickly start hitting that as a, as a limitation. Now, uh, you know, again, there are ways that you can work around that, so you can work on subsets of data and then combine your results and so on, but um, for the most part, they're the, the kind of big limitations. So the important thing with all of this, with everything that we're talking about with big data and with R, is the value of your data, and the value of your data really is in what you do with it. it you know, it's all very well to collect reams of data in your Hadoop cluster or wherever, even you know, in a SQL database or a CSV file, but that data is essentially worthless unless you actually then go on and do something with it. You know, whether you turn that into a data product or uh, some sort of useful insight for your business, until you actually do that, um, it's essentially just sitting around doing nothing, not generating any value for your organization. So, on top of that, I want to introduce Spark. Um, Spark is an open source cluster computing framework. Um, it came out of the uh, AMP Lab at um, UC Berkeley. Um, I th it's not very old, it's possibly, it's, I think it's around five years old from the time when the first paper was published. Um, for anybody who's interested, it actually was first mentioned in a paper on Mesos, the uh, sort of data center operating system, if you like. Um, and it came out of work on Mesos, essentially. Um, so it's primarily uh, an in-memory processing tool. Um, it will do things with disks, but primarily it tries to keep as much information in memory as is possible. Um, and it, in the past two or three years, it's been one of the most contributed to big data projects, um, it, uh, particularly relating to Hadoop. Um, so it's had more contributors than, than any other project in the kind of Hadoop, in the Hadoop ecosystem. Um, so the problem that it solves is that it makes big data processing very, very fast. It makes much, much more, uh, it brings you kind of closer to the, to the data in a sense, and it allows you to do interactive uh, work on much, much larger data sets than you can uh, traditionally with R. Um, there's minimal disk I.O., which helps improve the speed. Um, the programming abstraction is much higher level than if you were to try and write jobs in Java and so on. Um, Spark itself is actually written in Scala, which is a language built on that compiles to um, Java bytecode, so it's compatible with the Java virtual machine. Um, and obviously the speed and the high-level programming abstraction are things that bring it back into the realm of a tool that's suitable for exploratory work again, which, as I said before, MapReduce sort of not so much. Um, it's good enough that uh, at least one of the major um, Hadoop distribution vendors, a company called Cloudera, I don't know if you've heard of them, um, are talking about Spark now as though it's sort of a successor to MapReduce. MapReduce is not going away, but I sort of get the impression that they'll be talking about Spark as though it's the primary way to interact with, their, um, with the Hadoop cluster. Um, so it does this by providing a programming abstraction called an RDD. RDD is a uh, resilient distributed data set and it's basically a technique that they've developed to split data across multiple machines in a cluster, keep that data in memory, and then access it very, very quickly. The RDD API has been extended, I think that might have been in 1.3 or possibly version 1.4, um, to include uh, data frames, which are very, very similar to the data frames that you find in R. This is one of the reasons why it's a, a good fit, I think. Um, so the people who've developed 
uh, Spark have taken some of their inspiration from R and from uh, Python, particularly uh, Pandas. Pandas? Pandas, maybe? Whatever that library is called. Um, and they've sort of implemented what they feel are the, the best features into Spark's data frames. Um, the, I think the, probably the big difference is that, obviously I've been talking quite a lot about Hadoop, um, Spark is not limited to working with Hadoop. Uh, it can work with Hadoop, works with Hadoop very well, um, but it's not limited to working with Hadoop. So you could easily download Spark and run Spark on your laptop. You know, whether or not that would be a good thing, uh, I don't know. Uh, it's definitely a good thing for learning Spark, though. Um, but it also allows you to deploy um, ad hoc processing clusters. So Spark <coughs> itself, as I said, is a cluster computing framework. So you can set up Spark clusters that have no Hadoop at all and either load things from local file system or perhaps uh, Amazon's S3. Um, when you download Spark, it comes with um, some scripts and things to start a cluster on Amazon EC2. So you can very, very quickly, you know, maybe 15 minutes worth of uh, messing about, build yourself a cloud-based Spark cluster to work with. Um, but on top of that, it does also integrate with uh, Hadoop and obviously HDFS, the file system. We get asked this question a lot. I hate this question. I hate it so much. Um, will Spark replace Hadoop? It's kind of like a Python versus R question. It's like just learn them both or you know, whatever works for you. Um, but will Spark replace Hadoop? The answer very specifically is that Hadoop is an ecosystem and you can't replace an ecosystem with a single tool. If anything, Spark competes with MapReduce, not with Hadoop. MapReduce obviously being a component of Hadoop rather than a, uh, rather than a kind of synonym for Hadoop. Uh, Hadoop has many other uh, features and tools these days. Um, they're actually extremely complementary in the sense that if you use Hadoop to provide your big data storage, your data lake, if you, if you like that phrase, um, with HDFS, Spark will work very nicely on top of that. Um, and most of the, I think all of the major um, Spark distributors, obviously, sorry, all of the major Hadoop distributors bundle Spark with their products. Um, one thing that might be worth bearing in mind for you guys is that um, Spark R was only included with um, with Spark. I'm going to try and remember which way around it is now. So Spark R was included with Spark from version 1.4. So if you wanted to do anything with Spark R on a Hadoop cluster, you'll need Spark version 1.4 or higher, preferably higher, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, so very complementary. Um, it's I, I think it's much easier to use than MapReduce. Um, the the programming abstractions make working with data and slicing it about and so on um, much easier. Um, and this again, the speed and the simplicity of working with it bring it back into the realm of being suitable for exploratory work um, rather than just you know massive batch jobs that take three days to run while you're on holiday. Um, and again, this was previously difficult in uh, a sort of classical Hadoop deployment. So the original languages that Spark supported, I think from the outset, were Scala, it's written in Scala, Java, it works on top of the Java Virtual Machine, so neither of those two are surprising. Um, Python, because the guys who wrote it also know Python. And Spark R was a separate project, which also grew up from uh, AMP Lab at UC Berkeley, so it's you know very much related, um, very much a related project, just separate, and was integrated into Spark from version 1.4. Um, the people who develop Spark upset me last week because I had my talk ready, and then about a week, it was, I think it was a week ago, um, they released a new version, which completely changed the tone and direction of the talk, which was good of them. They don't care, obviously. <laughs> but uh, 
Yeah, so support's still evolving. Uh, version 1.5 was released last week. They, I feel like, I'm, I've not actually checked, but I feel like they're on a roughly three month release cycle. So they seem to be putting out a new release uh, roughly every three months. Um, and the support that is, I think, of most interest to our users, um, because support is still limited at the moment, um, is the support for massive data frames. So you can have data frames, you know, many orders of magnitude bigger than you could running either on your local machine or on a, on a server, a uh, single server. Um, so Spark R features, it has been designed by our users and designed to be familiar. Um, my R using colleagues tell me that it seems to have been designed to feel very familiar, particularly to dplyr users, um, although it's not implemented as a dplyr backend, it's an entirely separate package. Um, supports massive data frames. Um, an interesting feature that it has is that you can do uh, SQL operations on those data frames, which again I believe is a, a feature sort of similar to dplyr, although the implementation is different. Um, version 1.5 brings the opportunity to fit GLMs. Um, I think they only support the Gaussian and binomial distributions at the moment, but again, that will evolve over time. Um, the, uh, the GLM is built on top of a thing uh, in the Spark ecosystem called MLlib, so uh, it's one of the components of Spark. It's the, obviously the machine learning library. Um, and the machine learning library actually supports many more operations than that, so I'm expecting this to change very, very quickly. Um, so GLMs, in, there were no GLMs in 1.5, you just had uh, large data frames and the uh, Spark SQL operations on those data frames. Uh, 1.5 brings the first sort of level of integration with MLlib, um, and I'm expecting the rest of the integration to follow in a fairly short order, they're putting a lot of, uh, a lot of work into it. Um, so this, obviously, as I've said already, works on top of Hadoop or as a standalone cluster, or you can run it on your laptop. It's one of the great things about it. Um, and you can load data from a variety of sources. I think only a few sources, so S3, HDFS, and a couple of others are supported out of the box, but there are connectors, sort of modules, if you like, for Spark that will let you pull data out of Mongo or various other uh, SQL or no SQL databases. Um, so you can get your data from a variety of sources. Um, Spark SQL, as I mentioned, um, allows you to perform arbitrary SQL operations on massive in-memory data frames. Um, you can do, you know, select from and use standard, well, roughly standard, um, SQL operators uh, in order to slice and dice your data any way that you like it. Um, this obviously therefore treats that data frame as though it were a table um, and is useful for sort of exploring your data set, finding out more about what you've got in a particular data set and is also good for creating subsets of that data. Um, so here we've got um, a GLM, it's your classic uh, IRIS data set which I'm sure you're all probably bored to death of by now, but um, you've got the data frame being created in the first section, um, then a model is built using the GLM library uh, from Spark R. Um, as I say, only Gaussian and binomial are supported at the moment for the uh, GLM family, um, and then that's used to generate the predictions at the bottom. So that support is there. Uh, this is a, actually the, an example pulled straight from the Spark website um, and seems to work really well. Um, so the thing which I think Spark allows uh, people like myself, people with an IT background who work with uh, analytical computing all the time, um, it sort of lowers the barriers to adoption, I guess. So um, Hadoop can be very tricky to get started with, I think. You know, writing MapReduce jobs and things like that is not necessarily something that comes that naturally to people, and especially if you come from sort of an R and interactive um, exploratory kind of background. Um, 
Spark can run locally on your laptop. This is, for me, this is a, a huge benefit because it means that you can start to play with it in a, I don't want to say a safe environment, but it sort of is. Um, so you can start to play with it on your local machine and not have to worry about, you know, whether you've got the right versions or anything. You just make sure that you understand it up front and sort of build your way up to working on larger data sets. Um, you can build ad hoc processing clusters with it and as I've mentioned, supports pulling in data from a variety of sources. So current support, data frames, Spark SQL, and a limited subset of Spark's machine learning library. Um, it's currently missing any support for two other components of Spark, which is Spark Streaming, which is a kind of micro batch um, framework that Spark itself has if you're using Scala or Java or Python, um, and uh, graph uh, operations from Spark's GraphX library. So is it a love story? I alluded to this at the beginning. Um, with 1.4, I wasn't sold. I like massive data frames, don't get me wrong. Um, and I like being able to perform SQL operations on those massive data frames. But without any kind of modeling features or anything like that, it's a, it's a bit of a difficult one. With 1.5, obviously that changed. You've got GLM in there now, which is great news. Um, so I, I think in general, it probably is a bit of a love story. It's early days, but um, it's, you know, it's a, an ecosystem that's evolving rapidly and one which I think is probably well worth your attention if, you're, uh, if you have big data challenges in your future, which I suspect many of you probably will. So thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions?